You showed up. I'm so glad. I was a little nervous. I always try to speak early in the semester because I don't want you to get your 28 and go. So I um, appreciate that. I've asked Lena just to join me. How many of you are um, Lena door walkers? How many of you kind of try to go through the Lena door? All right. Good, all right. <laughs> I've asked Lena just to uh, read scripture before we get started today. So Lena. So our first scripture today is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. You are the salt, the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light, the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And then from Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 and 18. I am sending you out like sheep, sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. And then the last scripture is from Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 8. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you here at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Thank you. So I got a few props here for you. Um, I mean, not props. I mean, like, I'm not going to give you props. <laughs> so, uh, as I looked at the chapel schedule, I'm not going to talk about Job, so I know that was announced, um, but Andrea was kind enough to, like, give me an out and say, or whatever else the Lord's laying on your heart. So I went with that. Um, and the Lord was laying a lot of things on my heart, and he couldn't make up his mind. I hate that. Don't you hate that when God can't make up his own mind? I mean, and I was trying to help him because I had a talk all set, and I was saying, this is the one I'm going to do. And he was like, no, I don't think so. And so we argued. That ruined my Christmas break. Um, so we, we, you know, it's, hate to sell, it's hard to celebrate Christmas when you're arguing with God. Um, so over the last few weeks, I've just really been trying to focus on maybe what the Lord would have me say to you today. And I went back to the chapel curriculum, and I think, you know, Monday is Word, and Wednesday is Wisdom, and Friday is Witness. So as Lena just read, I want to talk to you a little bit today about Witness. In uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, the Bible says that we are created with three component parts. It says that we have a body, it says that we have a soul, and it says that we have a spirit. Body, soul, and spirit. And the thing that's important to remember about that is that this is all of you. Some of you, nobody here today brought their body but left their spirit home. Uh, nobody brought their soul today and left their body at home. Now, some of you may be physically here and mentally gone. I get that. But, but your soul is still here. I know some of you, you have homework to do. And because of Dr. Bounds, you have a paper or a quiz at 11. And, you know, and he's messing with your enjoyment of chapel right now. I get that. We'll talk with him about that. But you brought all of this with you today. 
And so when it comes to what's God's plan for your life, is it's very simple. God, God's plan for you is to invade your spirit and to come alive. Jesus didn't come and die to make bad people good. And Jesus didn't come to make mean people nice. Jesus came to make dead people alive. That non-Christian person who you love dearly is not a nice, just a nice person and not just a good person. They're a dead person. Scripturally, they are considered spiritually dead. And so what Jesus wants to do and what God wants to do is come in and invade your spirit. But you know, it's funny about God. He's never satisfied. You ever notice that about him? He's the center of it all. But he wants it all. He's never satisfied until he has all of you. He paid it all. He's the center of it all. And he wants it all. So he's not happy just living here. And what he wants to do is work his way out into your soul. Now, we know what the body is, right? We know we, this, is the, this is the body. This is what we have. Admittedly, it's not much. I mean, this doesn't just happen, right? Well, actually, it does just happen. I'm trying to correct that. Um, but this is our body. And then we, our soul is that part of us that's our personality. That's that part that, that really makes us us. It's, it's, our, it's all of our thoughts. It's all of our feelings. It's our personality. Um, I'm a, any, anybody take the Enneagram? Does anybody do the Enneagram? Okay. If you know that, I'm an eight, which means that's, um, you know, that's, if it's not, if I'm not healthy, that's really not good. Um, an Enneagram 8, that's a, called a challenger. That's my personality. But this is my soul. And then my spirit is that eternal part of me that God wants to invade. And that's that eternal part of our, of our makeup, that imago Dei, that image of God. What his plan is, is he wants to not just invade your spirit, but he wants to start taking over your soul. He wants to control the way you think. He wants to control your feelings. He wants you to have self-control. The fruit of the Spirit is love, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. He wants those to be increasing. He wants your soul to be transformed to the point where it starts to actually impact what you do. That it actually changes your behavior. Here, the Spirit and the soul can be what you believe. But you want, there has to be some kind of coherence between what you believe and what your body does. Between what you believe and what you obey. And when this happens, he says, you're going to be my witnesses. Now, there's three things that Jesus said in, in the scriptures that you're going to be. He said, you're going to be salt. You're going to be light. And you're going to be sheep. These are the three things that Jesus said that you are. You don't get any choice. Just like you don't get any choice to leave your body home but bring your soul and spirit. You don't get that choice. When you walked in, you brought all three. The same thing is true of you today. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are like sheep among wolves. The ministry of salt, salt's a funny thing. Salt is one of those things that back in the Bible days, it was actually used as currency. Um, we get the, it comes from the word salarium, where we get our word salary. And so soldiers would actually get paid in salt. It's like, thank you very much for serving in the war. Here you go. Um, and so, but salt was incredibly valued. It was a preservative. It was a preservative that had to be rubbed on food, whether it was in a drought time or a dry time or for what had to extend it. We now have freezers and refrigerators that do that for us. But salt was a preservative. And the main ministry of salt, the main ministry of salt is contact. You have to come into contact with salt. This salt right here is doing nobody any precious good at all. It's just sitting here. It's worthless to what its mission is. It has to be poured out. It has to come into contact with something. Light, the, the ministry of light, light is as you know, shines, you know, you've heard, let's shed some light on the subject, right? 
So light, the ministry of light is that it casts out darkness. It sheds light. It's about meaning and purpose. This is the ministry of contrast. This is the ministry of contrast, light and darkness. And then sheep, well, we know sheep. He says you're sheep among wolves. So we have our, we have our light, we have our salt. You know, we have our, can anybody, see, can you see that? Is that, is our, is our, I didn't know if the light's on, if that was going to happen or not. And then we have sheep. You are sheep, but not just any sheep. You're sheep among wolves. And so the ministry of being a sheep is the ministry of conviction. This has to do with your posture towards the shepherd. My sheep hear my voice, right? My sheep hear my voice, which brings up the next thing. If contact is about salt, what does the Bible tell us to do? It says to taste and taste and see that the Lord is good. Well, salt is about tasting, so this would be your mouth. Light is about seeing, this would be your eyes. My sheep hear my voice, this is about your ears. If you want an effective witness, you don't get to choose. Well, I'm going to listen to garbage, but I will refrain from pornography. I will look at pornography, but I will listen to worship music. If you want an effective witness, it's all three. Your mouth, what you say, your eyes, what you see, and your ears, what you hear. We had a little song when I was in Sunday school. Now, this was many years ago when the earth's crust was just hardening and the velociraptors <laughs> were still roaming the earth. Um, but we'd sing a little song, oh, be careful little eyes what you see, right? For the father up uh, is looking down in love. Oh, be careful little eyes, be careful little ears what you you're right, you got it, you heard it. Maybe you, so maybe it wasn't that long ago. What happens with this right here is that this requires three things from us to be an effective witness. This is going to get really messy. So, you know, you want to take lots of photographs of this, right? Salt, because it's a contact ministry, requires grace. It requires grace. When you come into contact people with people who are not Christians, who aren't saved, you need to do it graciously and winsomely. Paul said that he was trying to be winsome so he could win some. But you need to do it graciously. My generation, I'm over 40, I'm over 50, and we're going to stop with you know, transparency right there. My generation was great in this next one. The ministry of light is truth. We knew all the answers. The problem was nobody was asking us questions. Your generation is great with grace. You have wonderful relationships. But the danger is you're sacrificing truth. You've got to be able to speak truth into people's lives if they are in a, in a lifestyle or an orientation or a, habit or a habit that is sinful. You have to speak truth. But you don't have to do it with a hammer. And you don't lead with truth. You lead with contact. You lead with relationship. You lead with grace. But so often what happens is that once the relationship is established, we shuttle truth off to the corner because if I bring truth up, I'll lose the relationship. And truth is put off into a corner. And sheep, the ministry of sheep, is love. But it's not just love for the sinner. When the Holy Spirit invades your life and you move towards that moment of entire sanctification where you're able to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and also to love your neighbor as yourself. This is about your priority of love, and you love the shepherd above anything. 
Because if you don't love the shepherd above everything and everyone, you won't be able to hear his voice. And you will lose, you will lose your, your witness. Now, the ironic thing about this is that we have an enemy. We have an enemy. Satan is a real being and he's after you. He's after, and if he can't make you, if he can't keep you dead in your spirit, what he'll do is make you useless and ineffective. Second Peter even says, he lists all these qualities that he wants to happen in your life. And he says, if these are in your life and they're increasing, you won't be useless and ineffective. So Satan's like, okay, if I can't get to their spirit, I'll just make them useless and effective. Well, how does he do that? Well, Satan is a mimic. Satan can't create. He has no creative ability, but he can mirror. So Jesus is the lion of Judah, and Satan goes around like a roaring. Where did he get that idea? Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. When John the Baptist is born and Zacharias is praying, he talks about the sun rising and, you know, and Jesus being the light. And Satan parades around like an angel of light. In fact, if you read Revelation, this is free. This is, this is a free thing. I'm, I don't know if I'm going to have time for this, but I'm just going to drop my mic. Not in a good or fun way, just in a sloppy way. The Bible tells us there's a trinity, right? What's the trinity? Father... And the, right, so he's a trinity. And Satan's like, I want a trinity. I want a trinity. So if you read Revelation and, and you're in times of stuff, you'll see there's a beast, you'll see there's an antichrist, and you'll see there's a prophet. Well, where did he come up with the trinity idea? He used to live there. You know, he used to live there. Satan is not lacking knowledge. Satan is not lacking truth. And so Satan has a plan. And as you would suspect, this is a very terrible... I'll be back. I'm back. <laughs> Satan has a plan. And as you would suspect, it's just like God's, only in reverse. Satan starts out here with your body. And he gets you involved in stuff. It's just a habit. It's not a big deal. It's not a salvation issue, right? It's not a salvation issue. But he gets you doing it. Can you imagine if my wife were to say something like, hey, John, can you take out the trash? And I like, is this a divorce issue? And she's like, what? I go, is this a divorce issue? Well, no. Oh, then I don't want to do it. And a week later, she says, hey, I'm going to leave. I'm really busy. Can you do the dishes for me while I'm gone? Is this a divorce issue? Well, no. Well, then I don't want to do it. How long would that relationship last? It wouldn't. My wife and I don't believe in divorce, but she may believe in homicide. <laughs> um, right? So... <laughs> So it would end, right? So we come along, and God, and we start getting into habits. And how do we justify that habit? We say, well, is it a salvation issue? Well, no. Well, then I can keep doing it. And then we do it again, and we get into a habit. It's like, well, is this a salvation issue? Well, no. Well, then I can keep doing it. And Satan's plan is to get your body involved in enough habits to where it starts to affect your soul. Now you've got doubts. Now you've got feelings. Now you've got anxiety. Now you've got stress. Now you're feeling like, well, maybe I'm not saved. Now you start doubting your Father in heaven. You start doubting your Creator. And all of a sudden, your soul is disturbed. Why are my soul, hey, soul, why are you so downcast? Right? I mean, David only had adultery and committed murder. Why would his soul be downcast? And he wants your soul. 
Satan isn't at the center of it all. But he wants it all. And he's not happy with your soul. Now, he's, if, if he can't get to your spirit, that's fine. He'll leave you useless and ineffective for the kingdom. But he's after your spirit. He's after the very same thing that God is after. He's just starting in reverse. He's just starting in reverse. So you thought, wow, that's a lot. I'm glad he's done. I have another side. <laughs> nay, nay. And the Bible talks about this. And this is where we'll kind of wrap it up a little bit here. I lost my markers. There, I'm back. The danger with salt, if you come into con is when you come into contact, that's the ministry. The danger of salt, though, is contamination. So you have salt here. You can spend this much money on salt that's actually helpful, or you can get a bag of salt. You can get, oop, you can get a bag of salt. You're going to watch me get hung right in front of you. You can get a 50-pound bag of salt for the same price as this little thing. And if salt becomes con contaminated, what, what Lena read earlier was that it becomes useless and it's just to be thrown out and be trampled on by your feet because it's all it's good for. It's become contaminated. Light. Hide it under a bushel. I'm going to let it. The danger of light is concealment. So it could be useless. You can have your light shine before men. But what Satan wants to do, he may not be able to get your light actually shut off. But you can be in relationship with people and never bring it up. Because it would make them uncomfortable. It's going to make them uncomfortable. Contamination, you look so much like the world, I can't tell you apart. You're involved in so many things that you've actually lost the ability to preserve. You have no preservative, no healing qualities because you've become contaminated. Concealment. And the last one is with sheep. The danger with sheep. Is that rather than having conviction and listening to the shepherd, they just become really comfortable. In the world. And they like the world. You see, real sheep. Real sheep understand that there's two things that they're going to live with for the rest of their life. You will live the rest of your life, if you're really a sheep and you're really trying to live for the Lord, you will live with two convictions. Number one, the world is sinful and you're not going to change it. Totally. The world is getting worse and if you read your scriptures, it's going to get worse. And you can't change it. You're not ushering Jesus back to earth by making this heaven on earth. When Jesus comes back to earth, he will make it heaven on earth. But you have this one conviction that you wrestle with. And it's like, this is, world is sinful, but I can't totally change it. The other conviction you have is, but I can't give up. I can't not try. And that's the conviction that we live with until Jesus comes. But the danger is that you will just become contented in your walk. You'll become comfortable in your walk. And 
this is your witness. This is your witness. And he can go this way, full of grace, full of truth, and full of love. Or it can go this way. But you don't have the option. You don't have the option to say, you know what? I'm going to be graceful. That's me. I have the ministry of salt. No. No. You have all three. Well, I am the truth bearer. I love to speak truth to people. You know, I, I'm going to go into apologetics. You know, and I just can't wait to stand on the corner and rip these people. All right, for Jesus, but I'm going to rip them. You know, because I, I, that's what God has given me, that gift. Or, you know what, I'm just going to go into the world and be a sacrificial lamb and let people, you know, use me and abuse me, but, you know, I'm going to do it for the kingdom. No, it's all three. Just like body, soul, and spirit, you are salt, light, and sheep. And all of this is to be a sign to the world. Is to be a sign to the world. So here's the deal. Christmas comes and goes. And we read the story about, and you will find a babe, wrapped in swaddling clothes, right? Before that it says this, and this will be a sign unto you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. Well, Jesus doesn't catch bushes on fire anymore. He doesn't turn, he doesn't give people leprosy anymore. Some of you truth bearers be like, well, I wish he would. You know, that would, that would help my ministry. The sign that he has now to the world is you. Full of grace, full of truth, and full of love. It's the only sign. It's the only plan. There is no plan B. That's the sign. Would you stand with me and we'll pray. Father, thank you for sending your son full of grace, full of truth. Thank you that we read in Romans that God demonstrates his love for us and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Full of grace, full of truth, full of love. Help us to not settle for erring on the side of grace. Help us to not settle for erring on the side of truth. Help us to not settle for just erring on the side of loving everybody. Help us to be full of you so that we can be an effective witness for you and your kingdom. In Christ's name, amen. You're dismissed.